This is Becoming Anti-Fragile with I.J. McCann. Each week I read a book and highlight the actionable wisdom within. To become anti-fragile, you must strengthen your mind and live with conviction. Let's get into it. The new science of cybernetics has furnished us with convincing proof that the so-called subconscious mind is not a mind at all, but a mechanism, a goal-striving servo mechanism consisting of the brain and nervous system, which is used by and directed by mind. The latest and most usable concept is that man does not have two minds, but a mind or consciousness, which operates an automatic goal-striving machine. This automatic goal-striving machine functions very similarly to the way that electronic servo mechanisms function as far as basic principles are concerned. But it is much more marvelous, much more complex than any electronic brain or guided missiles ever conceived by man. This creative mechanism within you is impersonal. It will work automatically and impersonally to achieve goals of success and happiness or unhappiness and failure, depending upon the goal which you yourself set for it. Present it with success goals and it functions as a success mechanism. Present it with negative goals and it operates as impersonally and just as faithfully as failure mechanism. Like any other servo mechanism, it must have a clear-cut goal objective or problem to work upon the goals that our own creative mechanism seeks to achieve are mental images or mental pictures which we create by use of imagination the key goal is our self-image our self-image prescribes the limits for the accomplishment of any particular goals it prescribes the area of the possible like any other servo mechanism Our creative mechanism works upon information and data which we feed into it, our thoughts, beliefs, and interpretations. Through our attitudes and interpretations of situations, we describe the problem to be worked upon. If we feed information and data into our creative mechanism to the effect that we ourselves are unworthy, inferior, undeserving, incapable, a negative self-image, This data is processed and acted upon as any other data in giving us the answer in the form of objective experience. Like any other servo mechanism, our creative mechanism makes use of stored information or memory in solving current problems and responding to the current situations. Your program for getting more living out of life consists of in first of all learning something about this creative mechanism or automatic guiding system within you and how to use it as a success mechanism rather than a failure mechanism. The method itself consists in learning, practicing and experiencing new habits of thinking, imagining, remembering and acting in order to 1. develop an adequate and realistic self-image and 2. Use your creative mechanism to bring success and happiness in achieving particular goals. If you can remember, worry, or tie your shoe, you can succeed. This is an excerpt from Psycho-Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz. And this book is from the 1960s. It was written by Maxwell Maltz, who is a plastic surgeon. And this book came as a result of him having operated on hundreds of patients of his Uh, giving them plastic surgery. And what he found was that one of two things happened to people. One was that after the plastic surgery, whether it was they were getting a nose job, a lip job, getting a facelift, people either reacted very positively or very negatively. If people reacted positively, it meant that within days or weeks of having the operation, it was as if they became a totally new person, right? They were more confident. They were more optimistic about life. They were happier they tended to have this aura around them once they had their operation. And then the negative side of this was people could get extremely complicated surgery where, you know, their nose shape changes drastically or the size of their lips changes or they get a dramatic facelift, but nothing about them changes. They will often come back weeks later for their checkup and say, hey, doctor, 
I don't see any changes to my nose. I don't see any changes to my lips. I can still see the wrinkles and everybody around them, including Dr. Maxwell Maltz, will say, no, we did the operation. You can see this before and after. And even if they look at the before and after picture of their face, these patients could not see. They were unable to see the changes that was evident in their face. According to Maxwell Maltz, it's because there was something else happening inside of them. There was an internal self-image that had not changed. And it was only in him having done multiple plastic surgeries on multiple patients that he realized this. He realized that the plastic surgery that people wanted sometimes was just a symptom of what they were experiencing inside. So if they thought that their nose was the one thing that was preventing them from success in their life, then when they got that plastic surgery, when they got their nose fixed, their attitude completely changed. And it was as if they took on this new persona that was always within them. But somehow this small, tiny self-image that this larger nose or smaller nose created for them prevented them from coming out. Whereas for some of these negative people, the plastic surgery didn't do anything at all because their self-image was much stronger than the physical changes that was occurring. This is something for us to really think about because when you're reading Psycho-Cybernetics, I'll, I'll talk about the name in, in just a bit, but when you're reading Psycho-Cybernetics, you see that this idea that we can simply change who we are by pure will is much, much more difficult than people think. And it's most evident in these stories of people who get plastic surgery, right? So talking about the title Psycho-Cybernetics, this book had been recommended to me by people but I was never interested in it, mainly because of the title. Psycho-Cybernetics makes it sound like some sort of psych psychotic you know, robot that's going to take over the world. And as a self-improvement book, the title seems so weird that I never actually read it. And that's my own mistake because I read it for the first time twice this week. And what I realized was Maxwell Mall should have probably used a different name, but that's just on my end. The reason he uses Psycho-Cybernetics back in the 60s when he was writing it, Cybernetics was probably in the zeitgeist. And cybernetics refers to robots. It comes from the Greek term cybernets, which basically mean a steersman or somebody who holds a position or authority that can steer governing ships. And cybernetics in the 60s was a field where scientists were trying to figure out how to control machines and how to control living organisms. So Maxwell puts psycho in front of it because his insight through plastic surgery was that it is our psychology, our internal self-image about ourselves that can control how we act in this world, how we move in this world, what we end up doing in this world. It is all internally based. It is our self-image that determines this machine that we are inhabiting, which is our body. Now, one of Malt's ideas is that you and I are not machines. Rather, we inhabit a machine. So think of it like Think of it like you are the captain of a large sailing ship. You are not the ship, but you are that captain. And you can steer where the ship goes. And the reason this is important for Maxwell Maltz is he goes on to say that it is your conception of who this captain is or who this person is that will determine how fast, in my analogy here, how fast the ship can move, how much of an angle it can turn, what the capabilities of the ship are. And the reason this book, Psycho-Cybernetics, is considered one of the top self-improvement books is precisely because human nature has not changed over the past century, the past decade, the past 1,000 years, the past 10,000 years, 60,000 years. Human beings are the same. And for us to fully understand power of the message inside of Psycho-Cybernetics, you cannot be anomalist when you're reading this book. Anomalist is somebody who thinks that there is no such thing as natures in this world, and specifically, there's no such thing as human nature. The idea is that we are simply just a collection of ideas and memories. The opposite of this would be a realist. Realists believe that we have natures that can be apprehended, these universes like human nature that can be apprehended by you and I. When you're reading this book in the beginning, you might be tempted to believe that he is anomalist, or at least that he might be presenting the idea in an anomalistic way just because he says, what you think about yourself, how you imagine yourself determines who you are. You might be tempted to think that he's anomalous, but I think it's very important to, to realize that the only way psycho-cybernetics works for us is if you are a realist about natures. 
if you're a realist about nature, it means that you and I are not so different after all, right? That you and I both are particular instantiation of this universal call human beings. And because we're instantiations of, of this universal call human beings, the message is universal of psycho-cybernetics. Psycho whether you are in India, whether you are in the US, whether you are in France, the message is the same. So then we can focus on okay, what is the practical uh, ideas and practical wisdom from psychocybernetics? One of the main examples that Maltz uses in the book is this idea of a heat seeking missile. A heat seeking missile, when it has the target, is always going towards that target and self correcting. The, the guidance system, he says, is always self correcting in the zigzag manner. If it goes too far to the left, then it'll self correct towards the center. And this is analogous to how you and I function in this world. But the problem is oftentimes people, instead of realizing that life is a zigzag motion towards our goal, they go too far to the left and there's some sort of negative response. So instead of saying, okay, this negative response, I can use this to help me grow, they get stuck and end up creating a whole self identity around being this failure because they went slightly too far to the left. Maxwell says, this is essentially us. The heat seeking missile is like us. We we have that goal in mind. And so when we're headed for that goal, we're always going to go in the zigzag pattern. But the problem that people have is instead of realizing that the path to the goal, the path to whatever type of success that they have in their mind, they are somehow led to believe that this zigzag motion means that they're doing it incorrectly. So if they go far, too far to the left and, and there's some sort of negative feedback in the environment or negative feedback internally, they end up making that failure their identity. So then they get stuck and they never end up course correcting back towards the center and going forward. They just get stuck on that problem. So one example he gives or multiple, he, he, he gives multiple examples, but one that comes to mind is say you're in school. Right. It's very common for people to say, oh, uh, you know, I'm terrible in math. Uh, I can't do math because, you know, you failed in grade eight math, grade nine math. You got F's, you got D's, you got C's and you and therefore you think you're not good at math. And then you and I know people who are very good in math. You know, they got all A's throughout their whole school and end up becoming mathematicians, becoming accountants, becoming finance people. And the, the only difference between these, these two types of people is that the one who ends up becoming a numbers guy is that the numbers guy has an identity about himself as the numbers person, as somebody who is good at math. Whereas the person who ends up not doing anything in, within math, even if they had slight inclination towards being good at math, because they failed once or twice in their classes, they are now under this precept that they're not good at math. And so they never want to touch numbers. So anytime they see numbers, they have anxiety that they freak out and they have this uh, panic attack. So Malt says, look, what you have to do in this situation is you have to go back to that moment when you were told that you were not good at math or go back to the moment when you were led to believe internally by yourself that you were a failure in math. Malt says, Instead of saying, I am bad at math, or I'm a failure in math, you say, I have failed math. This slight change in tonality and language is crucial in starting to shift your identity. And the reason the shifting of identity is going to become important is it's going to impact everything you do from henceforth. So he says, look, if you want to be good at math, and if you want to pursue math again, you have to say, I failed grade eight math, full stop. Okay, there's nothing more to it. You don't identify yourself as a failure because you failed at one thing. He says, this is a course correction time. This is the moment where you go, okay, I failed at math. That means I'm going to go and study more and continue to work on this exact method. How does this idea play into the rest of psycho cybernetics? He says, who we are today is a result of all these environmental factors that have happened to us and also an internal picture that we create about ourselves, about you and I. You, you might be afraid of public speaking and you might be afraid of public speaking because when you were young, you, did, you were called up in front of class when you were unprepared and the teacher asked you a question and you weren't paying attention and you were completely embarrassed at the front. People, your friends were laughing at you. Your classmates were laughing at you. 
And the teacher ends up saying, I'm not going to call on you again because you did such a bad job answering the question the first time. And because of this, you might have an internal picture about yourself that you really are somebody who can never perform at a high level when the moment calls for it. And so then you might go on the rest of your life. So you might go from high school to university to always to slowly becoming more and more introvert of not putting yourself out there because you're afraid of failing and you're afraid of getting embarrassed. So by the time you get to an adult, you're in your career, you might be somebody who's always shy, always afraid, always pulling yourself back from thinking big and dreaming big because you're afraid of getting embarrassed. You might not want to have that conversation around asking for a pay raise because you feel that HR or your manager is going to say, no, you don't deserve this. But Maxwell says, these are all because you have this internal image within yourself that has had a cyclical effect on you. So each time you've tried to address this, your social anxiety, your internal anxiety, internal compass around being nervous kicks in when the stakes are high. And so then because you're afraid to actually confront that, you recoil and then it creates this, it creates a cycle of always being in the backseat. And so to address this, what we have to do is we have to sit back, review our life and address each and every one of these moments that you can think of. So he says, a human being always acts and feels and performs in accordance with what he imagines to be true about himself and his environment. This is a basic and fundamental law of mind. It is the way we are built. He gives the example of a patient who's around 40 years old who comes in for a lip surgery. As he's getting to know his patient, the surgeon says, hey, look, it seems like your lack of confidence in the way you are living because the, the patient you know, reveals to him a bunch of things about his life. Oh, and one of the examples is that he has this girlfriend, much younger than him, maybe in, in her 20s, who continuously tells the patient, Maxwell's patient, to not have the lip surgery because it's too expensive. Don't spend your money on it. And so Maxwell, when he's talking to this patient, says, hey, why don't you tell your girlfriend that you spent your whole life saving getting this lip surgery and then see what she says to you. He gives him the surgery, corrects his lips, so then his 40-year-old patient goes back to this girlfriend and says, hey, look, I got my lip surgery done. I spent all my life savings on it. And this young girlfriend gets extremely mad and says, look, I never wanted to be with you because of your face. I only wanted to be with you because of the money that you had. And now that you don't have any money, I'm done being with you. Your lip still looks ugly. I'm leaving. And she leaves. So something interesting happens with this 40-year-old man. After he gets the surgery, Maxwell notices a complete change in his confidence, in his courage, in the way he's moving about and acting towards Maxwell and around himself. But then when his girlfriend breaks up with him and tells him that she was never with him because of how he looked and that she was with him because of his money, and then she puts that dagger even deeper and says, your lip still looks horrible. What ends up happening is... This guy's internal image breaks down. He absorbs this negativity from this girlfriend, ex-girlfriend now, and starts to deteriorate extremely, extremely fast. So weeks go by, and when Maxwell sees him again for the checkup, he sees a completely different man. Maxwell says that his 40-year-old patient looked like he aged 20 years in the span of a few weeks. And he can't figure out why. And so as he starts talking to this patient, the patient reveals to him all this has happened and says, even my family is saying that I should have never gotten this surgery because now I have this bump on my lip on the inside of his lip. And the surgery didn't go great for me. It's making it worse. It's affecting my business. It's affecting my overall morale, my self-confidence. So Maxwell inspects his lips. And he finds out that this bump on his lip is just a scar tissue from the surgery, which apparently is very common. And he says, look, this is something very common and this, and we can just deal with it right now. So Maxwell goes, does a slight operate, a very small operation, removes the scar tissue, and this bump on his lip is gone. Immediately after that thing's removed and after Maxwell's had this conversation with him, this 40-year-old starts to regain his self-confidence there and then. And then when he comes back for a checkup, Weeks later, again, for the second time, he is now back more youthful than he ever was. He somehow aged backwards. So Maxwell's point here is you and I can be like this. Our physical appearance, not as if we can 
make ourselves age forward or backwards, but more so in how youthful we look and how youthful we, we feel and act. It can be deeply affected by our self image, our internal narrative about ourselves. So Maltz says, if we dwell upon failure and continually picture failure to ourselves in such vivid detail that it becomes real to our nervous system, we will experience the feelings that go with failure. On the other hand, if we keep our positive goal in mind and picture it to ourselves so vividly that it makes it real, and to think of it in terms of accomplished fact, we will also experience winning feelings, self-confidence, courage, and faith that the outcome will be desirable. We cannot consciously peek into our creative mechanism and see whether it is geared for success or failure, but we can determine its presence set by our feelings when it is set for success. We experience that winning feeling. So what he's talking here about is this idea of this win winning feeling, which he dedicates a whole section around, right? And this idea of winning feeling is basically evoking emotions of success now. And the success never has to be something huge, but it has to be some sort of success that makes you feel like you've accomplished a goal. And he says, look, we human beings are geared towards goal seeking. We are creatures of telos. And we'll talk about this in just a bit. But he says, look, you have to evoke these feelings of success. Feelings of success here doesn't mean monetary success. Here, he simply is referring to the feeling that you have when you do something that makes you feel proud. So whether that is when you stood up to a bully when you were young, when you helped an old woman cross the road, when you took care of your mom, when you won the spelling bee contest in school, whatever those success stories that are pre-existent in your life, he says, think about those things in vivid detail, evoke the feeling of winning, winning where you feel like you have accomplished something. He says, evoke these feelings. And when you're evoking these feelings, apply it to this new perspective that you want to create about yourself, this new self image that you want to create. So if you're trying to become somebody who's comfortable with public speaking, it's very important that you place yourself and imagine yourself speaking on top of the stage to a large crowd, making sure you're putting all the details in this imagination in your mind, seeing the faces of the people in, in, the, in the front, seeing the curtains behind you, seeing the screen behind you, seeing what you're wearing, how you're feeling, uh, feeling the lights upon your face as you're moving, feeling the ground underneath you. As you're creating this new picture around yourself, he says, evoke this feeling of success at that point as if you're already a very successful public speaker and create this memory in your mind. Replay this memory in your mind over and over again with this emotion of winning. And when you do decide to start practicing it in real life, outside of your mind, outside of your imagination, you will find that it becomes much easier slowly over time much more comfortable now doing public speaking than you were you were when you did not used to practice this. So this is a, you have to think back in the 60s. This is somewhat of a new idea. The fascinating thing about all of this is that when you are truly focused on the future state of where you want to be with all the intention of all the emotion that you are bringing forth with using this winning feeling that he's talking about, when you get to the state where you are imagining the future. It seems that your body and your mind cannot tell the difference between what you are imagining in your mind and reality itself. It's as if for that moment in time when you are visualizing this new reality, that inner thought that you have is more real than the outer environment during that process. There begins to be changes in your brain you start to create new pathways in your brain about what it's like to be in this future because your mind is now thinking that it's a memory. And this also speaks to the power of placebo effects on people, right? The reason why certain people are more prone to placebo or have experienced placebo is because their body truly feels that they have been given a drug that can make them feel better. So they convince themselves into feeling better. And it's very similar here with what Maxwell is talking about. But he does give examples of sports athletes who do this. And he gives examples of multiple golfers who, when they were asked how they won, how they got such a perfect score or how they did so well in a particular tournament, 
these golfers saying, oh, I played the course in my head. Not only did I play the course in my head, I had already seen myself hitting the most perfect shots with each strike. And so by the time I got to the tournament and I hit the golf ball, I'd already done it before and it was nothing new. And this is very common for high performing individuals, whether in sports, entertainment, they'll say, look, I visualize what I'm about to do before I even do it. I see it all in my head. I see the whole game in my hand being played. And I see what I'm what I'm going to do when this happens, when that happens. I see myself going for the shot. I see myself um, dribbling past people. I see myself swimming the fastest lap I've ever swam. I see myself knocking out my opponent. And if you want to see somebody, in my opinion, one of the most powerful person who can visualize and bring or manifest his visualization would be Conor McGregor. If you look at Conor McGregor's interviews before his fights, bef- before he gets a double title, you see a Conor McGregor who is completely confident in how he's going to defeat his opponent. He'll say, oh yeah, I'm going to take him out in the first round by doing this and this shot. And everybody laughs at him. And then when that event happens, when that fight happens, he beats his opponent just as the way he described it in the interview two days prior. And he does this multiple times. And so I I had watched an interview with him, with Tony Robbins a few years ago. And he pretty much says the same thing. He says, look, my whole career, my whole life coming into the UFC, winning the double belt, becoming basically the most successful, the highest paid athlete at that point in the world. He says, it was all through visualization. I saw it all in my head before any of this happened. And the same thing goes with uh, another athlete that comes to mind is uh, Anthony Joshua. He says the same thing. Kobe Bryant also says the same thing. All these high-performing people say the same thing. They see it all in their head. They see that they are going to be successful, not only because they've drilled the movements, they've practiced it over and over again physically, but also mentally. And so when the actual time comes, It's as if it's a memory of them winning. And so they end up winning. So Conor McGregor in this interview with Tony Robbins, you should look at it. If you just look up Conor McGregor, Tony Robbins interview, he talks about how quit being a plumber because he used to be a plumber when he decided that he wanted to go full in into mixed martial arts. He says, my sister gave me a book and the book was The Secret. The Secret is a book around the law of attraction. So he said, my sister gave me this book about law of attraction. I thought this was complete garbage, but you know what? I decided I'm going to read it. What is there to lose? And so he reads it and says, you know what? What does it hurt if I apply these principles? The, the way the book is structured is they are basically quotations of people from across all walks of life talking about very similar to what Psycho-Cybernetic talks about in the section around the winning feeling, right? And they say, you have to imagine and evoke these feelings of succeeding in whatever goal that you've set yourself, but obviously putting in the hard work. But it's very important that you have a goal in front of you that you can pursue because without the goal, you're never going to hit a target. So Conor McGregor does this. And even before he's gone into the UFC, which the UFC is, if you're listening to this, and have never watched the UFC or heard of the UFC, the UFC is the most successful mixed martial art organization in the world right now in 2023 and will likely be the most successful for many, many years to come. So Conor McGregor, before he's even in the UFC, he says, look, I'm going to be the UFC champ. And he's not even he's not even won a single title at this point. But he sees himself winning. He sees himself winning all his fights through his visualization. And by the time he gets to the UFC, He is on a trajectory to be one of the most successful UFC athletes. And not only does he become that, he becomes one of the most successful athletes in the world. And one last point about Conor McGregor and his power of visualization and evoking of this feeling is there is a very small interaction, about five, 10 minutes between him and Cristiano Ronaldo. Cristiano Ronaldo being one of the most successful footballers in the world. Footballers meaning soccer player in the world where they're talking and Connor says, you're the richest athlete in the world right now. And Cristiano goes, oh yeah, yeah, I'm the richest right now. And they keep talking and Connor says, in about three years or five years, I'm going to be the richest. Because at this point he's ranked maybe like 15 richest athlete in the world. And Cristiano's one. And there's a huge gap between them, hundreds of millions of dollars of gaps between them. 
And then within that amount of time that Connor says in that interview, ends up becoming the richest sports athlete in the world. It's crazy just to think that Connor basically spoke his future before it even happened. And Maxwell Maltz in the 1960 has discovered this through his practice of plastic surgery. And when he sees his patients and he sees that these people, the ones that become very successful in life after their surgery, is that this plastic surgery was the last piece of their self-image that needed to be changed. And when it was changed or made better, their full personality came forth. But those patients who were not successful, even after drastic plastic surgery, were those that had a very poor self-image about themselves. So he says, everyone at some time or another being successful in the past, it does not have to have been a big success. It might have been something as unimportant as standing up to the school bully and beating him up, winning a race in grammar school, winning the sack race at the office picnic, winning out over a teenage rival for the affection of a girlfriend, or it might be the memory of a successful sale your most successful business deal, or winning the first prize for the, for the best cake at the country fair. What you succeeded is not so important as the feeling of success which attended it. That's what we're talking about. It's the feeling of success. I'm continuing. All that is needed is some experience where you succeeded in doing what you wanted to do, in achieving what you set out to achieve, and something that brought you some feeling of satisfaction. And he says, go back in memory and relive those successful experiences in your imagination Revive the entire pictures as much detail as you can. In your mind's eye, see not only speech, business deal, golf tournaments, or whatever that accompanied your success. What sound was there? What was your environment about? What else was happening? And he's going through this and saying, look, to understand, for you to change whatever self, poor self-image that you have about yourself, you need to revive these feelings of success and use that feeling and apply it into this new understanding about yourself, right? So if you're trying to go from somebody who has social anxiety and can't go to parties, cannot attend social events because there's just too much anxiousness that comes upon you when you, even when you just think about going, he says, look, think of all the times that you've succeeded in other areas of your life. Take that feeling. Now imagine yourself going to a social event, calming yourself down, relaxing, and then apply this feeling onto this moment and see yourself interacting with people, random people. Just see yourself going there, talking to them, having a great time. What you'll find is that after doing this over multiple times and make sure, obviously, and make sure that it's as detailed as possible so that when there's an opportunity for you to go to a social event, you have done this multiple times in your head, you know that feeling now. So then when you actually go, you'll find that your social anxiety is gone but not gone fully, but gone so far as you are able to interact without onset of panic. So then he has this whole section around the power of hypnosis, basically reprogramming your mind to be successful in this new endeavor about yourself, right? This new image about yourself. So to quote him, he says, it is no exaggeration to say that every human being is hypnotized to some extent by ideas he has uncritically accepted from others or ideas he has repeated to himself or convinced himself are true. These negative ideas have exactly the same effect upon our behavior as the negative ideas implanted into the mind of a hypnotized subject by a professional hypnotist. He gives the example here. If you've ever seen a hypnotist do his work, it is one of the craziest things because it seems so unbelievable that people would actually be hypnotized. However, you and I are hypnotized constantly and daily by the things we allow to enter into our minds without, without critically thinking about it. When you're scrolling through your social media or when you're scrolling through the news, you might be reading things that are not really good for you, right? That are not helpful at all, that probably evoke feelings of negativity, feelings of panic, feelings of pessimism, but you, you still consume it and you consume it like you consume unhealthy foods. And he's saying you have to be careful about what you consume because what you end up consuming is what you end up projecting about yourself. So when it comes to hypnosis, he gives the example, two examples I want to bring up is he talks about how a hypnotist convinces some strong men, like extremely strong men that they will be unable to lift these extremely light weights. And so when these people get hypnotized, they go to pick up these lightweights and they just cannot lift it. And they're trying as hard as possible, but they simply cannot lift these lightweights. 
they don't know what's happening to them. So then he unhypnotizes them and then they can lift it up again. The, the hypnotist hypnotizes them again. They can't lift it. And then all of a sudden they, they seem extremely weak, right? And then he gives you the other example of people who place their hand on a table and the hypnotist says, hey, look, you know, relax your body, relax your mind, listen to my voice. You are now, your hand is now stuck on this table by the strongest glue and you can't take it off. So when these people are awoken by the hypnotist, the hypnotist says, hey, take, remove your hand off the table. And these people cannot remove their hands off the table. They're trying as hard as possible, but for some reason, they cannot remove their hands off this table. And when he dehypnotizes them, they can remove it. When he rehypnotizes them, they can't remove it. The point that Maxwell here is making is these people who are being hypnotized, it's not like the strong man's strength disappears when they're hypnotized. Neither are people's hands actually stuck there, right? It's not like their abilities are being affected and being removed. Instead, what's happening is that they have a false belief about themselves, which causes them to not be able to take action, like lifting 10 pound weights when you weigh 300 pounds and can generally lift 500 pounds of weight. It's this false notion that the hypnotist has placed inside the minds of these people that convinces them that they can't do these things. You and I are like this people if we're not careful because what we allow into our mind will have a negative or positive effect on our abilities, on our strengths, and on what we can do. If you have told yourself for the last 20, 30 years that you are terrible at math because you failed AP math, because you failed grade eight math, he says that is a form of self-hypnosis. And the good thing about all of this is you can reprogram your mind the opposite direction. And so he goes on to say, look, you can rehypnotize yourself. And rehypnosis is not this scary thing. It's simply understanding that what you allow inside of your mind, what you constantly reflect upon, impacts the way you act in the world, right? What are these negative thoughts that are in your mind? And how often are you thinking about these things? And are these thoughts that you have about yourself true? And if they're not true, he says, just remove them and replace them with something else. And this reminded me, of a very well-known biblical passage from Philippians when Paul says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. It seems like St. Paul knew something about this. St. Paul here is talking about the power of your mind. Whatever you allow your mind to constantly reflect upon, it will ultimately come out into your life. So Maxwell Maltz says, man is by nature a goal-striving being. And because man is built that way, he is not happy unless he is functioning the way he was made to function, as a goal-striver. Thus, true success and true happiness not only go together, but each enhances the other. This is why I think Maxwell is a realist and not a nominalist, even though up until this point, he's talking about uh, how these different beliefs about yourself create the self-image of who you are. But he says, look, the most important thing about a human being is that he is a goal striver, that he has a telos that he's directed towards. And this telos, he says, is in man, the goal to live is more than mere survival. For an animal to live simply means that certain physical needs must be met. Man has certain emotional and spiritual needs which animals do not have. Consequently, for man to live encompasses more than physical survival and procreation of the species. It requires certain emotional and spiritual satisfactions as well. Man's built-in success mechanism also is much broader in scope than animals. In addition to helping man avoid or overcome danger and the sexual instinct which helps keep the race alive, the success mechanism in man can help him get answers to problems, invent, write poetry, run a business, sell merchandise, explore new horizons in science, attain more peace of mind, develop a better personality, or achieve success in any other area which is intimately tied to his living or making a fuller life. Maxwell here is saying it's this idea of who you are and allowing yourself to creating a new self-image using your creative mechanism, right? This is the idea of visualizing and evoking these emotions. One note that I made around this is when he says, consequently, for man to live encompasses more than physical survival and procreation of the species. It requires certain emotional and spiritual satisfactions as well. 
it brought to mind the story of the rabbi in uh, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, that's episode one. So what happens with the rabbi in Viktor Frankl's story is after the uh, war, after the Holocaust ends, Viktor Frankl opens a, a practice and in one of these practice sessions, he has a rabbi uh, come in and the rabbi comes in and the rabbi is very, very upset and depressed. And when Frankl talks to him, Frankl finds out that not only did the rabbi lose both his wife and six of his kids all under the age of 10, but his new wife that he married after the war, turns out that she is infertile. So the rabbi is extremely sad and he says he's extremely sad because he believes that rearing children is what gives meaning to his life. But Viktor Frankl stops him and says, procreation of the species cannot be the most important thing in this life, that which gives meaning because it's something that human beings and other species do constantly and all the other animals do this and they never think about meaning. So as he starts poking and prodding, trying to get to what the rabbi is really upset about. He says, hey, rabbi, you believe in God. You're going to see your six children in heaven, are you not? And he says, yes, my, my children are already in heaven because they were innocent. And, they were, and he says, yes, my children are already in heaven. But that's the thing. I'm not going to see them in heaven. And so the, uh, Victor Frankl says, why not? Why aren't you going to see your children? You believe in heaven. So why, why would you, as a rabbi, not go to heaven? And... The rabbi responds saying that he's an old and sinful man and thus unworthy to enter heaven. There he breaks down and says, you know, I will never see my children because I've done sinful things in my life, too many sinful things in my life. And Viktor Frankl pauses here and he gives a response which I, I continue to think about because it's such a powerful thing that he responds with. And, it's, and he says, Rabbi, what if... It is precisely for this reason that you have survived your children. What if it is so that you can become a better man, become a better husband, become a better human, such that by the end of your life, you can be worthy of entering heaven? And at that point, the rabbi looks at Viktor Frankl and says, for the first time, I have found peace. And this is precisely what Maltz is talking about. He says, look, there are certain spiritual and emotional needs that humans have that go beyond all this physical need. And one of these things, he says, is this, this telos that's built in within human beings. He says, whatever your goal is, and I'm quoting, your built-in success mechanism must have a goal or target. This goal or target must be conceived of as already in existence now either in actual or potential form. It operates by either one, steering you to a goal already in existence or two, discovering something already in existence. And I'm continuing from a different section, but related. The automatic mechanism is teleological. That is, operates or must be oriented to end results goal. Do not be discouraged because the means whereby may not be apparent. It is the function of the automatic mechanism to supply the means whereby when you supply the goal, think in terms of the end result and the means whereby will often take care of themselves. So what he's saying here is when you have these goals in your mind of what you want to do, what you want to accomplish, think about them, visualize them as the example I gave of Conor McGregor, visualize them, evoke these feelings of you already having accomplished these things what you'll find is as you start to contemplate on this new image of yourself, you will start to orient yourself, as he says, as, as a servo mechanism missile does, zigzagging towards the goal. But it's very important to have this goal because without this goal, nothing happens. What ends up happening is you end up going nowhere. So he says, do not be afraid of making mistakes or of temporary failures. All servo mechanisms achieve a goal by negative feedback or by going forward, making mistakes and immediately correcting course. And he goes on to say, skill learning of any kind is accomplished by trial and error, mentally correcting aim after an error until a successful motion, movement or performance has been achieved. After that, Further learning or continued success is accomplished by forgetting the past errors and remembering the successful response so that it can be imitated. And I'm continuing. You must learn to trust your creative mechanism to do its work and not jam it by becoming too concerned or too anxious as to whether it will work or not or by attempting to force it by too much conscious effort. I made a note here 
and said, this is like jujitsu because when you're doing jujitsu, when you learn a technique for the first time, if you're new to jujitsu, it feels like a whole new world. You don't know what's going on. Even as the coach is going through step by step what you're supposed to do, even after you've seen it multiple times, sometimes you can't even imitate it because your body is doing things that, that you've never done before. You're not used to the movement and you'll make multiple mistakes even in that short period of learning one technique. If you're learning to do an arm bar, for example, the arm bar basically is when you control your opponent's wrist and lock their shoulder and bring their elbow over one of your hips and break their elbow. Well, breaking is not the right term here. It'd be, it'd be more like dislocating or tearing some of the um, ligaments in there. If you've never seen an arm bar, when you see it, it looks very weird. And then when you're learning it, it feels even more awkward. But over time, as you continue practicing the movement, in the beginning, it has to be very conscious, right? You know the goal that you want to do, which is to be able to break your opponent's arm. And as you progress towards working on that, slowly over time, once you get used to the movement, you stop thinking about how to do the armbar and you simply do the armbar. You get to it like that. And this is the case with just practicing jujitsu. In the beginning, it's very, very confusing. You're learning all these techniques, sometimes in systems, sometimes disparately. And when you are live sparring, none of these movements come to you naturally. But you can see other people who've been training for years, how smooth and how effectively they can apply these techniques. You know in your mind that if you consistently show up, you're going to get to that position. You're going to get to a point where these movements become second nature to you, that you can simply just apply the armbar as easily as if you were walking downstairs. But all of this requires very similar to what uh, Maxwell's talking about here. You have to trust yourself in having a goal. And when you have that goal, you have to see yourself getting to that goal. And the way you get to there and how you get to there, you cannot think about too much. And he says, you must let it work rather than make it work. This trust is necessary because your creative mechanism operates below the level of consciousness and you cannot know what is going on beneath the surface. Moreover, it's nature to operate spontaneously according to present need. Therefore, you have no guarantee in advance. It comes into operation as you act and as you place a demand upon it by your actions. You must not wait to act until you have proof. You must act as if it is there and it will come through. Do the thing and you will have the power, said Emerson. I couldn't agree more with this statement because oftentimes you and I can get stuck, whether that's Jun Jiu-Jitsu, whether that's having a plan to start a business or to pursue a different type of position somewhere else. You wait for there to be proof. You wait until somebody gives you a compliment, until somebody encourages you to do it, until you can finally apply the move. He says, look, do not wait for these things. Simply start doing it. And it's perfectly okay to fail, as, we, as I mentioned in that quote previously, where he said, do not be afraid of making failures. All servo mechanisms achieve a goal by negative feedback or by going forward and making mistakes and immediately correcting course. So he says, look, for you and I, it's this idea that we simply have to act. Obviously, don't act foolishly, don't act brashly, but act as if the goal that you want to accomplish is already present, already uh, guaranteed, even though it's not guaranteed in advance at all, right? So the most important thing is as you work towards this goal, you, like your self-image, will start to shape and become the person that is, in one sense, worthy of this goal. And that's very important because sometimes you can get to a position where you feel unworthy and then you end up having what is well known as imposter syndrome. And the reason imposter syndrome happens is precisely because you don't believe that you are worthy of the position that you have, whether that an executive position you have at work, whether you have a successful business, whether you have a successful family life. Sometimes you can feel like you don't deserve what you have or that you are acting a part. And it's very important in this in these situations that you do not let that consume your mind because if it consumes your mind it will become evident in the work that you do it will become evident that you'll start to make mistakes and then you'll start to think oh that other people see the mistake i made i have people realize that i am an Im imposter in this role no you're not an imposter in this role one you got there because you you have the skills you have the proper skill sets and so you just have to change this image that you have about yourself and so one of the practical ways he says of reworking this is by lying down or sitting down, getting into a state where you're completely relaxed. And the reason it's very important to be relaxed is when you're not relaxed, when you're tense, uh, when you're anxious, even if you 
try to even if you imagine these new scenarios that you're placing yourself so that you so that you can get used to being in these positions your body will subconsciously reject this so instead what you want to do is you want to relax your body so that when you considering and when you're visualizing these new states visualizing this upgraded in one sense upgraded version of yourself you can really absorb it he has this one technique where you lie down you imagine that your legs are made of steel and it's slowly sinking into the bed and then your other leg is made of steel slowly sinking and then slowly you work your way up to your whole body the goal here is to relax your body to loosen up all the tension and then from there visualize what you want to do evoke that feeling of winning that success and again the success here it can be anything it can be the success of creating a delicious meal last weekend for your friends and they said this is incredible it could be as small as that doesn't you don't need a whole string of success according to malts and it does, also doesn't need to be big it can be small and it can be very short uh, line of successes but once you get that in your mind and you you can see it very clearly in, in your mind's eye you take that feeling you take that those emotions and apply it to this new situation that you want to do right whether that's you want to be a better public speaker whether that's you don't want to have social anxiety when you're around people uh, whether that's asking somebody out on a date all of these apply the thing that stops you from doing these things in real life is because you you haven't practiced it one but secondly you haven't developed new image about yourself and so you continually revert back to these old bad habits you might have and this is applicable in negative habits and characteristics that you have let's say an example is you cannot help but get drunk every time you go out right anytime you go out and you start drinking one bottle of beer you end up consuming 20 bottles of beer and for some reason you cannot stop it even if you wanted to now there are obviously lots of methods to stop this but one of the ways would be to visualize yourself going out with your friends either not drinking at all and having practiced the courage of saying no i don't want to drink i just want water potentially able to give responses in your mind's eye of when your friend says well why aren't you drinking being able to give a response and then going through that situation over and over in your mind with the feeling of being in the bar with the feeling of the music with this smell of alcohol with sense of camaraderie and then having the courage to say no that could be an example right where you can apply this idea of psycho cybernetics to have the ability to say no and not get drunk that weekend for the first time all because you have a new image about yourself and in creating this new image it allows you to see yourself through this new person in quotes and in seeing yourself through this new perspective you can say no to things you can say yes to things it's much easier to change your habits when you have a new image about yourself the other thing that's very interesting is a section he calls emotional facelift here he's talking about look for many of my patients whose life didn't change after the plastic surgery he says most of the time they had an emotional scar that needed to be healed and that needed to be dealt with but they just didn't deal with it and he says one of the best best ways to give yourself an emotional facelift is and this is not going to be a surprise to you and i but is forgiveness and he goes on for pages about the power of forgiveness and it's interesting because here in a self-improvement book from the 1960s he's talking about forgiveness you don't actually read about forgiveness in self-improvement books too often from most of the books that I've read. But he says, look, the reason forgiveness is important is that in forgiving, you heal yourself. You start the process of healing this, this scar that you have, whatever it is, whether that's you admit you were treated poorly as a child, uh, you were treated poorly by friends. He says, forgiveness, when it is real and genuine and complete and forgotten, is the scalpel which can remove the pus from old emotional wounds, heal them, and eliminate scar tissue. And he says forgiveness is one of those things that when you truly forgive, it actually becomes evident in your physical body. You become less tense. You, you actually start to look better, he says. And I quote, in removing old emotional scars, you alone can do the operation. You must become your own plastic surgeon and give yourself a spiritual facelift. The result will be new life, new vitality, and newfound peace of mind and happiness. I was talking to a friend quite a few weeks ago, and he had an unstable relationship with his father. And his parents were visiting. Obviously, 
the tension, because the parents were staying with them, the tension in the house was flaring up. But as he was reflecting on it, he realized that he actually hadn't forgiven his father. All these years, over the past 30 years, he's never forgiven his father truly. And so for the first time he sat there, as he's reflecting, he's, he told himself that he is going to forgive his father. And he forgave his father, walked up to his father, gave his father a hug. And he said, at that point, when I embraced my father, for the first time, there was peace. And it was as if a huge burden was taken off my chest. And whether my father had forgiven me, I had forgiven him. Maltz writes, therapeutic forgiveness cuts out, eradicates, cancels, makes the wrong as if it had never been therapeutic forgiveness is like surgery forgiveness is one of the most powerful things in the world it is one of those things that we often never talk about because it seems such a trivial thing to forgive but when you truly forgive somebody you forget when you truly forgive somebody the wrong that they have done to you it starts a process of healing and for you and i for us to live in this world in a way that would be meaningful, would be happy, it needs to have forgiveness. Whether that's forgiving your spouse, your siblings, your parents, your friends for the wrong that they may have done to you. It is very important we don't harbor anger because when you harbor anger, the only person that's harmed in this exchange is yourself. When you harbor anger, you're essentially carrying hot coals on your lap, thinking that your anger is getting back at the person. But really, you are burning yourself. You're burning a hole in your soul. And what forgiveness does, it's, it's taking that coal and dropping it. And yes, you may have the scars there, but you have forgiven them. And that scar will slowly heal over time. And to this point, Malt says, your forgiveness should be forgotten as well as the wrong which was forgiven. Forgiveness which is remembered and dwelt upon reinfects the wound you are attempting to cauterize. If you are too proud of your forgiveness or remember it too much, you are very apt to to feel that the other person owes you something for forgiving him. You forgive one debt, but in, in so doing, he incurs another, much like the operators of small loan companies who cancels one note and makes out a new one every two weeks. How accurate is that? That's the way I think we should think about forgiveness. Once you've forgiven, you don't think about it and you move on. The most concise way of remembering all of this is actually found in the middle of Psycho-Cybernetics on page 112, which is chapter eight, and it's called the success type personality. And in it, he gives an acronym and the acronym is success, sense of direction, understanding, courage, charity, esteem, self-confidence and self-acceptance. I'm going to go through each one and read you a quote from it. The first one, sense of direction. He says, get yourself a goal worth working for. Better still, get yourself a project. Decide what you want out of a situation. Always have something ahead of you to look forward to, to work for and hope for. Look forward, not backward. Develop what one of the automobile manufacturers calls the forward look. Develop a nostalgia for the future instead of for the past. The forward look and a nostalgia for the future can keep you youthful. Even your body doesn't function well when you stop being a goal striver and have nothing to look forward to. This is the reason that very often when a man retires, he dies shortly after. When you're not goal striving, not looking forward, you're not really living. In addition to your purely personal goals, have at least one impersonal goal or cause which you can identify yourself with. Get interested in some project to help your fellow man, not out of a sense of duty, but because you want to. So that's the first one. Now moving on to you, understanding. He says you need to get an understanding because without a proper understanding, you won't really know which information to take in, which information to reject. So he says, look for and seek out true information concerning yourself, your problems, other people, or the situation whether it is good news or bad news. Adopt the motto, it doesn't matter who's right, but what's right. An automatic guidance system corrects its course from negative feedback data. It acknowledges error in order to correct them and stay on course. So must you. Admit your mistakes and error, but don't cry over them. Correct them and go forward. In dealing with other people, Try to see the situation from their point of view as well as your own. This is 
extremely important in that if you if you're unable to parse out what's good and bad information then you can get caught up in all the bad information and have the self-negative talk which is going to come up in self-esteem so now moving to courage for c he says having a goal and understanding the situation are not enough you must have the courage to act for only by action can goals desires and beliefs be translated into reality and this is something you and i have talked about we are action-oriented people. We have to live lives that are action-oriented to be willing to take the risk for our opinions, for our beliefs. And this is what Maltz is pointing at. He also says, nothing in this world is ever absolutely certain or guaranteed. We often think of courage in terms of heroic deeds on the battlefield, in a shipwreck or similar crisis. But every day living requires courage too, if it is to be effective. Standing still, failure to act causes people who are faced with a problem to become nervous, feel stymied, trapped, and can bring on a host of physical symptoms. And then he goes on to say, Another helpful suggestion is to practice acting boldly and with courage in regard to little things. Do not wait until you can be a big hero in some dire crisis. Daily living also requires courage, and by practicing courage in little things, we develop the power and talent to act courageously in more important matters. This is very true. We often think that we are going to be courageous, that we're going to stand up for people, stand up for the weak when the time comes. But if you've never practiced standing up for the small things, standing up against the bully in your life, confronting people who are mistreating you at work, when you're seeing somebody else getting mistreated, you're not going to stand up for them. From courage, we're going out to charity. And that's the other C. He says, for charity, the prescription is threefold, right? The first is to try to develop an, a genuine appreciation for people by realizing the truth about them. The second is to stop and think about other people, be more compassionate. For the third point, he says, act as if other people are important and treat them accordingly. In your treatment of people, have regard for their feelings, we tend to feel about objects in accordance with the way we treat them. Move on to E, which is esteem. So in esteem, he says, you need to have a good self-image. He says, stop carrying around a mental picture of yourself as defeated, worthless person. Stop dramatizing yourself as an object of pity and injustice. The word esteem literally means to appreciate the worth of. Why do men stand in awe of stars and moon? and the immensity of sea, and the beauty of a flower, or a sunset, and at the same time downgrade themselves, why don't we appreciate the marvelous creation that we truly are? The fact that you are alive right now is a miracle in so far as the probability of you existing is incredibly low. When you factor in how your parents met, and how their parents met, and how, how your grandparents met, so on and so forth. Now the other part, and now moving on to the acronym, and we're getting to... The second last one, which is self-confidence. So he says with self-confidence, confidence is built upon experience. And with each successive experience, you can become more and more confident. But sometimes you don't have that previous success. But he says, what's important is that you have had previous successes, even if they were not big. So quoting Maltz, use errors and mistakes as a way to learning. Then dismiss them from your mind. Deliberately remember and picture to yourself past successes. Everyone has succeeded at some time at something. Especially when beginning a new task. Call up the feelings you experienced in some past success, however small it might have been. The last letter in the acronym is the other S. And this is self-acceptance. He says, No real success or genuine happiness is possible until a person gains some degree of self-acceptance. The most miserable and tortured people in the world are those who are continually straining and striving to convince themselves and others that they are something other than what they basically are. And he concludes with this. Accept yourself as you are and then start from there. Learn to emotionally tolerate imperfection in yourself. It is necessary to intellectually recognize our shortcomings, but disastrous to hate ourselves because of them differentiate between your self and your behavior you are not ruined or worthless because you made a mistake or got off course any more than a typewriter is worthless which makes an error or a violin which sounds a sour note don't hate yourself 
because you are not perfect. You have lots of company. No one else is either. And those who try to pretend they are are kidding themselves. And I want to end with that note. If you've enjoyed this episode, one of the best ways to support this episode is to subscribe, give a review on Apple Podcasts, leave a review on Spotify, and subscribe. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend, tell them about this podcast, because we want to live a life that's meaningful. And each week, you and I are going through these books so that we can get actionable wisdom from these books, apply it to our lives, and continue to work on living a meaningful life. So until next week, peace.